Um, I drop the lights because we love our graphics, so uh, hopefully this will be great. Uh, so this is me, and um, I actually, I've been at NVIDIA for about three years. I um, have many, many roles and, and wear different hats at NVIDIA, um, and this is um, one that pretty much brings together everything that I do. Um, it's actually a research accelerator. So for eight weeks, um, we bring together AI scientists or computer scientists with, in this case, planetary scientists. And that could be um, solar plasma um, physicists. It could be heliophysicists. Um, anything to do with protecting the planet. Um, essentially, it started with NASA asking the question, how do we harness AI? But what we managed to do was put both sides of the equation into the same room, give them um, a few weeks, and at the end of which they literally have a TRL prototype, so that's tech-ready level prototype. So it, we, we like to accelerate everything at NVIDIA, essentially. So what I'm going to talk to you about is, is the, the hardware side, the evolution side, but also the, the, the personal side of, of AI. And I've got a lot to get through, so I will uh, keep on moving through. Um, I love this slide, simply, um, so this, this comes from Ray Kurzweil's Singularity, um, the, the book, and it's um, essentially an indication of, of where we are. So at the moment, um, the world's affordable um, computers, we believe by 2025, will mimic the brain power of ourselves, uh, the human brain. Um, but this is basically because of the way things have been progressing um, since back in 85 when we're essentially at a billionth of the capability of ourselves in computer-wise. Um, and then moved to a millionth um, and then a thousandth in, in 2015. So we, we're on track by 2025. Um, and it's, um, it's probably the, the other side that we have to think about. This is a great image from um, Tim, Ur Tim Urban's Wait But Why. Um, probably one of the best AI articles that I've ever read. It's a bit of an epic. Um, it's in two parts, but essentially it talks about the fact that um, we have a lot of biases, um, and the biggest one probably is, is what we actually think about AI and the fact of how fast things are actually progressing, not just on the compute side, but also on the, on the AI side. This is the actual reality, um, and... Um, Tim, Tim goes on to describe this in a lot more detail than I actually have, but the simple fact is that we really are in um, this, this world, this, this era of AI, um, and it's, it is most definitely defining us. Um, unsupervised um, techniques, things like autoencoders and GANs, generative adversarial networks, um, are being used, but certainly not as much as, and as significantly as much as um, supervised learning applications, which is why people are always talking about data. Data is essentially like experience. You know, it takes us 25 years to, be, to get to PhD level. The more data that you throw at an AI system, um, the, the, the more profound it is, and the more applicable, of course, um, to each of the, of the problems that, that, that we have. But don't make the mistake that deep learning is everything. Please don't fall into the hype that you actually see. This is a slide from, um, from Yang King Jia. He's um, ex-Berkeley, um, now Facebook. Um, this is one of his slides from the Scaled ML conference back in March. Infra AI is Facebook's internal infrastructure for AI. And the reason I'm showing you this is to just um, show even at Facebook at that kind of level, you know, billion scale um, AI, they're still using support vector machines. They're still using classical machine learning as well as convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks. So um, don't think that deep learning is, is everything. In fact, this is actually work um, on electrophysiology at ETH Zurich. Um, they're basically studying the currents that flow through, through our brain. Um, Fraunhofer's Christoph von der Malsberg has completely um, just eliminated deep learning. He doesn't believe in it whatsoever. He's jumped ahead already, and he's looking at things called net fragments um, that are, it, essentially they, they act as, as puzzles. So deep learning is one step on this road, on this evolution that we're, that we're witnessing, just very, very accelerated right now. Um, so don't believe the, the hype, believe in the research and um, study 
on, from the research. There are upwards of 80 papers a day being published now um, on archive. Um, and the power um, of, of AI, I think, is because we share this knowledge now. Um, it, not only can you publish overnight, you know, in a, in a matter of an hour, once you've actually written the paper, but we can share it amongst ourselves, and that really counts. We spend a significant amount of time on human intelligence at NVIDIA. We have a large research arm, both in Santa Clara, California, where HQ is, but also in Helsinki. Um, and and we, we need to do this because we need to provide proof of concepts to all of the customers that we actually work with. Um, it's things like Cutlass, um, and again, you can just go to the GitHub site and actually download this. All of our software is free. Cutlass enables um, you to, uh, to essentially, again, it's just fast linear algebra, algebra but it's, it's putting the power of our latest card, our latest hardware, and the instruction set that we wrote for that, which is something called TensorCores, where we are taking the brunt of the matrix multiplication and accumulate operations and making it even easier. So we kind of optimize as much as we can and then just push out there. Um, so getting down to the actual applications, this is what time series data used to look like. Very, very laborious, very boring, um, and, and not that easy to comprehend. You know, I just had a conversation before. We are not geared to be able to um, understand the entire human genome, for example. This is how time series data um, should actually look like. What you're looking at is a 1.1 terabyte um, data set. Hopefully you can see that. It's still a little bit bright here. It's a 1.1 terabyte data set of a supernova. Um, the full simulation essentially is over 1,077 time steps. With GPUs, we could basically produce the compute and the rendering within 10 minutes of this entire incredible, I mean, a, a supernova can literally be over in seconds. Um, but the compute on CPU, the original computation was on the blue water CPU only. Um, but this is, the generation of the data and the simulation is really, really important to us. Um, what you have to do as well is just remember why we're all here, why people study AI, why we, um, why we invented AI. Um, and it's essentially to, to augment ourselves, to make life easier for ourselves. Don't fall into the trap that it's all about people losing jobs. It's probably just going to um, move a few people into jobs that they'll have a much better life doing. Um, but it will also help people in the jobs that they already know. It's really important when you deploy AI to just augment existing skill sets and to try not to disrupt too much. Um, and a lot of people are, are really aware of that. There are things happening today that maybe you don't actually know about that you thought were science fiction. Colonel, Brian Johnson has actually um, been working on, on his company, Colonel, and brain-computer interfaces for over a decade now. It was only this logo in the, in the bottom left here is actually Neuralink, which is Elon Musk. As soon as Elon Musk jumped on this, then obviously everything got um, a little bit bigger on the, on the PR scale, on the marketing scale. What they're doing is they're literally um, working with organic silicon and they're, find, they're trying to bring down the, um, the, the bandwidth, the, the latency um, between us and, you know, if you think about how long it takes you to write a text message or, you know, even just um, have a conversation. These things are happening right now and it's very, very profound. Um, a lot of what um, is almost done, in a sense, now, is the training side of supervised learning applications. Inference, so, so inference making the prediction based on new data, is the next big challenge. And this is because we're coming down to low power, low swap, size, weight, and power budgets. Um, and, you know, it's not just mobile phones anymore, it's tiny sensors that are all over the place. Um, this is um, just, you probably won't be able to read it too, too easily, but this is uh, the latest McKinsey um, study on, on AI. Travel, so transportation, self-driving cars, trucks, trains, autonomy in vehicles is, you know, over, is, is double the, the average um, throughout the entire sector. Um, so basically, it, it's no surprise that we're certainly all in on self-driving cars, because if you nail the self-driving car application, 
that includes every single other application that you could think of. Um, it's not, it's, it is mainly convolutional neural networks simply because they work in the, in the, in the static world. This is about pattern, pattern recognition for the static world. Um, but then we keep coming up with really cool tricks. So capsules or capnets um, was the latest paper from Hinton's lab. Um, this essentially allows you to put nested layers within each layer of the convolutional neural network, but it also allows something called dynamic routing where the system itself can basically determine whether or not to use certain amounts of information. It's almost a sense of, a sense of reasoning, um, but it's a very powerful self-learning technique. Um, RNNs, or rather the, the implementation um, that, that works of LSTM, has been around for over 25 years. Now, this still dominates the, um, the dynamic world where it's time series or sequential data. Um, the actual space that we're looking at is, is phenomenally um, complex. So the mathematics, and uh, it really does come down to matrix multiplication and accumulate, the mathematics needs GPUs um, in its parallel processing capability. Volta, for example, has 5,120 separate cores. So that's 5,120 separate um, operations that it can cope with, even before you started getting into hyperthreading. Um, there's lots of other techniques that are, that are being um, brought up day in, day out, actually. Pruning is a good one because it brings down not only the floating point operations, but obviously the compute time, time to insight um, expense. Um, and it actually shows that certain connections are irrelevant or, you know, at least redundant to, um, to the applications at hand. Um, this is a very active area of research. Uh, things like differentiable programming. Um, this is the GOMBOK, and uh, basically um, folks believe that dynamic programming will allow us to do much more exquisite optimization. It's a, it's, it is really all about optimization. Feature engineering can be done purely by, by um, optimization. And this is a sense of um, things like meta-learning, where we're using the neural network to literally optimize itself. Um, to, to design better neural networks. And it kind of goes on and on into the inception, like the movie, essentially. Um, so this is sort of um, deep dive into, into the Volta streaming multiprocessor um, multi architecture. Um, the reason I'm showing this is, is, is literally just to highlight that we are developing so fast, um, and this is simply because of the demands of the AI research community. We're developing so fast that it's actually getting quite hard for people to keep up, and that includes the mass, the long tail of researchers. There are a core set of researchers that know how to use tensor cores, four by four by four matrix arrays, um, which speeds up this, this matrix multiplication, dramatically speeds up. Um, but it's really difficult to, you know, essentially educate everybody. The same with things like parallelization. So deep learning training, the whole point of using GPU is, is for all of the processing cores. And most people still haven't moved onto multi-GPU. When you actually look with a single GPU, clearly you load, the, you load the data and you're just doing weight updates that are local. When you start bringing in multiple GPUs, um, you have to start splitting between them. So first of all, you would load the training data and then you have to synchronize the weights um, between it. So essentially you're, you're coding differently. It's parallel programming. There are lots and lots of um, tricks again. So Uber came up with um, Horovod and we were working directly with them and, and we've, we've done integrated software um, which helps on that. But when you start getting into the multi-GPU territory, you also have to then take into account this massive amount of data transfer that's going on in between the GPUs and GPU to CPU. Don't forget the GPU is a coprocessor. You still need the CPU. So this is essentially us optimizing um, PCIe. This is us optimizing to five times the speed of PCIe Gen 4. Now, um, every switch, and we essentially had to do that, and I'll show you why in just a few more slides. But this is the really profound stuff that's going on now. Um, and it's, it's the way that we learn as well, learning by mistakes, learning by extreme trial and error, essentially. But it, it, it basically aligns perfectly with robotics. So 
the reinforcement learning and the robotics side, and remember that the, that the, the best example of a robot is the self-driving car itself. In fact, it's actually an easier version because you deliberately don't want to, you know, bump into things. Um, this maps perfectly with, um, with reinforcement learning. You essentially, you, you're given an environment, so an agent then basically um, is in a state, it has to make an action, and the consequences of that action um, affect the environment, and you're bringing in reasoning all about it, and this just goes on and on, and this is how we live our lives, essentially. So we're getting very, very close to the neuroscience side. Um, now, robotics um, on, the, um, on the physical side, so this is the Atlas um, robot from uh, Boston Dynamics. Um, the Spot Mini that they used to have, Spot Mini actually came to, to the number one AI conference in um, 2016. It didn't have any kind of AI, it was just very, very cool. You know, this thing walked around the stage and everybody was on the chairs, you know, taking selfies and, and all sorts of things. But there was no AI. Literally now, Spot Mini has um, autonomous navigation. Um, I remember having this conversation with, with the CEO that, you know, you really have to get some AI in that, it would be very cool. But on the, on the virtual side, it's very, very powerful because you have infinite resources. It doesn't matter if this $1 million uh, robot falls over and gets broken because it doesn't get broken. It's in a virtual environment. But you can also um, harness the capability of parallelization, having thousands and thousands of virtual agents all playing against themselves. Here, they're essentially trying to learn good behavior, not knocking into one another, etc. And we've actually been playing in this space um, for, for quite a while now. Well, this, this tends to just go on and on and on. But um, we've been playing in this, in this space, in this virtual environment space for a long time. We call it immersive AI. And we actually produce something called Project Holodeck, which is essentially just a virtual world. Um, and you can bring in any kind of CAD model. Here, we brought in a CAD model of a, of a race car. You put on a VR headset, you all get you all join each other in the virtual environment and you can work on it. And you have full manipulation, full haptics. It's also photorealistic. Um, you know, we're not gonna, we're a graphics company essentially. We're not going to uh, mess up on the actual graphics. But what you can also do, which is even cooler, is you can put deep learning into the virtual environment. What you're looking at is um, my colleague Hamad's, um, it's the screenshot or the view from his VR headset. He's in the virtual environment. We've created this really cute nursery look. Um, and he's teaching the robot with reinforcement learning um, and um, value and policy networks, actually, um, how to play dominoes. Once that robot's learnt how to significantly beat, um, you know, you in at dominoes, that's literally just you, you end up with a trained set of weights. And then you can just deploy that into a real robot. Um, and this, um, obviously, this is just a, a trivial example. Um, it's got a really hilarious audio, but um, what you do is you do your training in simulation. This is just one. Obviously, you could have thousands of these robots, these virtual PR2s, um, doing the training, and then you actually just deploy. Um, and like I said, you're literally just deploying a set of weights um, into a real robot, and it learns by reinforcement learning. Um, I don't have time for this to sort of play out in full, but... Um, it's, it's really that simple. And then, obviously, playing hockey, putting a hockey puck into a net isn't that productive, clearly. So you need to be doing something um, applicable. And, and this is what the self-driving car is. And, and people are starting to use reinforcement learning, but actually um, supervised learning aspects have, have really picked up on pretty much every single aspect. Um, and, and it's multiple networks that are being used um, to actually produce results that are adequate and, and safe. Um, this is a, a huge endeavor. Um, we've actually been doing this for quite a few years now. We have a small fleet of cars. Um, and those who are struggling with the data, this is another reason why we're doing so well in AI. And I mean, by we, I mean society, um, because we share data. This is the latest from, from Berkeley um, Deep Drive. They've just released another 100,000 videos that are um, bound in boxes, et cetera, that, that you can use to get started on. Um, this is Waymo's car craft. Waymo uses this because their virtual cars can literally drive billions of miles a day. Um, you, can, you can bring up any kind of corner case that you can think of, and it's really essential. This is work, um, a research paper that we've just put out, 
um, from NVIDIA Research, which actually describes um, the difference between using simulated data and using um, real data in, you know, f and deploying that in the real world and what difference it would actually make. And it turns out that it actually improves the system by using simulated data as well as real world. But the biggest problem is the staggering amount of compute that you actually need. And this is why we are literally re-engineering constantly. Um, things like 100 DGX. Each one of these nodes is what we call DGX, and I'll show you in a minute. Um, you need about 100 of them per car to compute um, the actual data that, that is being brought in. So what we did was we literally redesigned and, and, and built a chip specifically for self-driving cars. Now, it's an ASIC, an application-specific integrated circuit, but that application is AI, is deep learning, is the matrix um, um, multiply and, and accumulate operations. Um, there are so many different factors on board. It's six separate processes, and one of them is, is, is what we call DLA. It's the Deep Learning Accelerator. Um, and we actually open sourced it. So you can actually go to this website, get all of the tech specs, build it yourself, um, and deploy it. Because what we're trying to do, essentially, is turn that, which is the boot of, uh, of today's self-driving cars, into this. But the really phenomenal thing, um, and of course, this is AI and the demand from researchers that's driving this. We, we basically do what the researchers need. We've already surpassed Xavier. We've put two of them together to make Pegasus, which is capable of 320 trillion operations per second. We're down at int eight now, so we're not dealing with floating point. Um, and then we've done it again because we've, we've essentially, in, in just a few months, put two Pegasus together. Um, and we now have Orin, which is the next generation. There's also a version um, called, we, we have embedded GPUs, which are about the size of a credit card. And there's now a Xavier version of Jetson. Um, if you're already developing on the Jetson platform, you can apply for early access, which will be in August. Um, and it's, it's pretty phenomenal um, what it's capable of doing. There's a, also a really cool demo. We just did a, a live webinar yesterday. Um, and this relates to, you can go to the GitHub um, to figure out exactly how you use Jetson um, to, to do live, real, um, you know, very profound work, um, especially in, in robotics. Um, this just goes to show the difference in the performance and the jumps that we've actually made um, across um, CUDA on its own um, versus CPU, um, codec. So this is video encode, decode that is just another part of it. Um, and this is all because we recently um, partnered with ARM. Um, and this is all about enabling AI um, the, and, and IoT. This is a very busy, complicated slide, and it's intentional, because you can't do anything at scale until you address this entire scene, what we call orchestration. And it is very, very complex. Um, to be able to put all of the hardware together um, to, to do at scale, um, you know, if you think about Facebook and data centers, that kind of thing. But basically, we work with everyone involved, even down to the storage now, which is getting prepared for AI. It's AI-ready storage. Um, and that's because we've actually been working in the HPC space for, for over a decade now. We know what it takes to actually build a supercomputer. Um, the Summit um, supercomputer came online just a few days ago in the US. Um, that's using all our, all our Volta GPUs. It's capable of 3.3 exa operations per second. That's um, a billion billion. Um, it's really staggering, but it's all about bringing faster insight to the massive, you know, think of that supernova, being able to, to get insight in, in 10 minutes um, for something as massive as a, as a supernova. And, and this is why we're essentially building this entire platform, which I'll just whip through these now. All the software is free. Just sign up to developer.nvidia.com and you just get the, get the software. We've done a lot of the hard work for you. Tensor RT4 is specifically, it's almost, it's a compiler essentially to optimize inference because you cannot have, um, for example, a self-driving car taking just a couple of seconds, for example, to make a decision. It has to be nanoseconds or, you know, at most seven milliseconds is the target. So we have to make this as absolutely fast as possible, and that's using any of the major frameworks. It basically pipelines through TensorRT and then deploys anywhere, whether it's a car embedded or in a data center, for example. 
Um, it's actually, we've done all the development with Onyx. I don't know if anybody's actually heard of this, but this is about standardizing the fact that there are 60 plus different deep learning frameworks out there. Um, and it, it's also supported for Xavier. And we have to do that because this is the latest thing that we've actually done, which is we now don't have DGX, which is those nodes I showed you in the supercomputer. That's eight um, GPUs. We now have 16 GPUs in two different layers. And that's the reason that we had to re-engineer MV switch, which is this fabric interconnect. Um, we literally have to, have to design it all. Um, because this is what people are um, craving now, um, industry as well. This is essentially like having a data center of your own. It's, it's capable of two petaflops. Um, and it is literally the size, it's like the coolest mini bar you've ever seen, because that's the size of it. Um, but it's a data center. But again, as with all of the DGX systems, we've made things as, as simple as humanly possible. And all of the software is within that appliance. So you can have it as a self-contained unit. If, if for example, you're, you're in a very sensitive, you know, perhaps government facility and you can't just link to the internet, it's, it's actually all self-contained. Um, and the container registry is all about literally keeping the software up to date because the iterations on the software is um, unprecedented. Ever since I joined NVIDIA, I think we were at um, QDNN, so that's CUDA for Deep Neural Networks, we were at version one, we're now at version seven. Um, CUDA itself is in version nine. It's constant, but with the containerized system, you literally just, just pull down the latest update. And so it makes everything really simple. And that includes visualization and simulation software that's really important. So that was a ton of info. Um, don't think that you have to remember everything. We also put a stack of training online. There's some free classes, um, but there are over um, 200 different classes bespoke to whatever application um, concerns you. Just go to nvidia.com or .co.uk slash DLI. DLI means Deep Learning Institute. And it's a very cool way of learning in a um, Jupyter IPython notebook environment where you can literally run code because we're bursting into um, Amazon Web Services. All of the major cloud providers have our GPUs on board, but it's a very simple way of learning more um, because if you are a beginner, jump on this really fast train, but really if you are a beginner, you won't get it until you've played with some code, even if you've never coded before. So this makes it very simple to, to literally jump on board. If you have any really cool ideas as well and you, you're trying to set up a startup, we have a full program where we provide support. Um, and this includes you know, anything from cash prizes to discounts on, on hardware. It's really about the fact that we've built this ecosystem to, to help people move forward and, and progress with AI. Um, we have lots and lots of conferences. The next one is um, in October in Munich. So come along if you want to to learn even more. And that's it. Thank you very much.